right, hello everyone. So happy to see you today. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Carrie Schmidt, I'm owner of Plentiful Philanthropy. I'm also proudly serving on the CMC board um, and so happy to help introduce today's exciting forum um, and very interesting forum that we're about to have. For those of you joining by live stream, we're coming to you from our home in Columbus's historic Italian village, uh, the Ellis. And we are welcoming you to the CMC annual Mary Lazarus Forum celebrating women in society. Mary Lazarus is very, very valuable to CMC, our history, and one of our founders. So thank you, Mary. If you scan your QR codes at your table, you'll see the many organizations that support your not-for-profit Columbus Metropolitan Club. Those include the Mary Lazarus Legacy and Civic Engagement Fund, Crane Group, the Columbus Women's Commission, Event Marketing Strategies, and the Ohio State University. Thank you to today's forum partner, the Women's Fund of Central Ohio, and our host, The Ellis. We're also grateful to have our presenting sponsor of our live stream, the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation, and to our live stream partner, the Columbus Dispatch. And yes, every CMC forum takes a village to make happen. Let's thank everyone for their support of today's forum. Thank you. All right, down to business. The title today's forum should make the goal of our conversation clear. It's time to end the gender wage gap in Columbus. Woo! So let's do that. The gender uh, pay gap is unfair, inequitable, and is illegal. Paying women less than men for the same work has been against the law since 1963. And yet, based on today's full-time wage gap, women entering the workforce stand to lose nearly, brace yourselves, $400,000 over the course of a 40-year career. With today's panelists, we'll dive into how to close the gender pay gap once and for all. To introduce today's panelists, we welcome Columbus City Council member Lourdes de Burros de Padilla for today's sponsor, the Columbus Women's Commission. Lourdes, thank you. Well, good afternoon. This is an amazing room. This room is actually revolutionary because I don't know if you looked around and saw the amount of powerful women in this room, not by your title, but just by your sheer being and being here today. Um, happy late Women's History Month. I mean, they give us these months, but we all know that for us it's a 365, 24-7 proposition, but everybody else gets to join in the party for 30 days. I want to um, quickly shout out uh, my fellow commissioners from the Women's Commission. Can you all just stand, or if you served on the Women's Commission, can you just stand and give a wave? Don't be shy. I see some of y'all out there. Thank you. Um, it is a lot. Women are asked to do a lot, and we always still say, give us more. And so thank you for continuing to do more. I also want to um, uh, shout out our mayor, my partner in good, uh, Mayor Ginther. I heard that he's here in his official capacity as first gentleman <laughs> this morning. Um, OK, friends, we're going to dive in. Here's the simple truth. Our economy has not been working as it should for the women in this country, and unfortunately, it's not by accident. It was built that way. Across industries, equally qualified women are less likely to be hired than men were paid less and promoted slower for doing similar work. Women are routinely shut out of good jobs in high-paying industries such as science, technology, and construction. And study after study after study has shown women are expected to shoulder an unequal share of unpaid caregiving responsibilities. When families can't find or afford caregiving, child care, elder care, or home care, it often falls on women to fill the gaps. Mom has to go part-time or leave the workforce entirely so she can somehow, some way, take care of her family with little to no income. And here's how all of that adds up. Today, on average, working women who are working full-time year-round make just 83 cents for every dollar that a man makes. 
and for women of color, the gap is even wider. Over a 40-year career, a woman will lose out on about $400,000. For black, Latina, Native American women, that loss in wages is closer to $1 million. That is money that a woman could use to pay off her student loans, put a down payment on a house, pay for a mortgage, start that small business, we all got a side hustle, or save for retirement. So in effect, the gender gap acts as a virtual tax, making it difficult to both pay the bills and invest in our futures. And as the panel will discuss, and the business leaders here today will agree that closing the wage gap is not just a moral issue, it's a business issue. We can't afford to leave more than half of our workforce behind. For example, in 2017, a study by the Institute for Women's Policy Research found that the poverty rate of working women would be cut in half, in half, if women earned as much as men. The research also showed that equal pay would add an additional income of more than 500 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars to the US economy. And one factor that contributes to pay equity is the common practice of requiring job applicants to share their salary history. Why does that matter? Because it allows how much an employee has been paid in the past to impact how much they will be paid in the future. And for many women, this practice can mean that inequitable pay from a previous job will follow you into a new job. And that's why this last year, along with my colleagues, we put a stake in the ground and move beyond simply asking for commitments and good faith efforts to create real social and system change. The salary history ban went into effect in Columbus this Women's History Month. <laughs> because the reality is that pay transparency creates accountability, and accountability drives progress. This policy and system change narrows the pay gap and ensures equal pay for all. And that's important because when women succeed, we all succeed. That's why I'm excited for this conversation today, so we're gonna go ahead and hop into it. Please give a warm welcome to our panel, Dr. Joyce Chang, Professor of Economics and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at The Ohio State University. <laughs> the First Lady of Columbus, Shannon Ginther, and also the Chair of the Women's Commission. <laughs> Barb Smoot, President and CEO for Women for Economic and Leadership Development. And finally, my friend and our host, Tanya Sayers, Director of Advocacy for the YWCA of Columbus. Tanya, we look forward to this conversation. The podium is yours, my friend. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, council member, for the warm welcome and for all you've done to help us close this gap of pay equity right here in Columbus. It is great to be here and see so many uh, familiar faces to talk about what has become too familiar of a topic. The gender wage gap is a persistent inequity that has eluded workers, employers, and every level of government despite the Equal Pay Act that Carrie mentioned that made wage discrimination on the basis of sex illegal. An inequity that robs women of hundreds of thousands of dollars over their lifetimes. So today we're gonna have a conversation about how to tackle this problem for good. Um, our panel of experts will share their efforts to eliminate this gap and what's at stake if we don't. So before we get started, I'm going to add a little bit to some of the framing that we've received um, from, from the folks that just shared. You heard some of the statistics. Let me localize them a little bit for you. So in Ohio, full-time, year-round workers, women, earn 81 cents on the dollar. And when you add in part-time workers, right, our folks that are working low-paid, hourly jobs often, um, that is 71 cents to the dollar that men earn. We are 29th in the country, according to the National Women's Law Center in 2024. And we know this disparity is greater for women of color, as the council members shared. And today, we are hosting this event um, on 
Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Equal Pay Day. That means that it takes this many days into the year for um, an Asian woman to earn as much as a white man did in 2023. Um, Asian American women and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander women earn on average 80 cents to the dollar compared to white men, but actually have the widest gap when it comes to ethnicity. Um, many East Asian ethnicities and Indian women earn on average more than white women, and even some men. But some ethnicities, especially those who call Central Ohio home, earn significantly less. Vietnamese women earn 59 cents to the dollar, Bhutanese women earn 56 cents to the dollar, and Nepalese women earn 51 cents on the dollar. So it's an important day for us to recognize that disparity as well. So we've made the problem clear. Let's talk about solutions. Um, in 2017, the Columbus Women's Commission introduced the Columbus Commitment, a voluntary employer-led pledge dedicated to closing the wage gap and fostering pay equity. The first pledge was actually signed at the YWCA ballroom on what was then um, Latina Equal Pay Day. And now it's been signed by over 400 Columbus area employers who have committed to addressing their internal policies, sharing best practices, and implementing solutions. Two of our panelists were actually part of the genesis of that commission, both First Lady Ginther in her role as chair of the commission and former commissioner Barb Smoot. So First Lady, I would love to hear what you've learned over the last seven years since this commitment was first introduced, and more importantly, what role do you see the commission playing in holding adopters accountable to their pledge? First of all, thanks, thanks so much for hosting this today to the Metropolitan Club uh, and to my fellow panelists. Um, just thinking about where we started, what we've learned is that um, employers are willing to have the conversation. They are more and more ready to have the conversation um, about what equal pay means. When we started this seven years ago, it was actually, I was just talking to Shelley Biting, who's the former executive director of the uh, Columbus Women's Commission and, and in the room. Um, we hosted a breakfast at the art museum on my 40th birthday, so that will be seven years ago tomorrow, where we highlighted the data for local CEOs who were stunned, many of whom after that refused to go back and look at their data because they weren't sure what they were going to see. That was seven years ago. We have come a long way. Uh, with help of many of the commissioners, including Barb Smoot, trying to get folks to sign on and just look at their data. And oftentimes, and even the mayor will tell you, you're surprised at what you find. Even in the mayor's office, there was a pay disparity. So then the next opportunity is, what do you do about it? And sometimes you can't fix it immediately if you're a small business, if you, um, you know, need a couple of years to build it into the budget. It takes time to learn what to do and how even if, for example, you fix the pay gap, if you don't put other policies into place in your place of employment, pretty soon you're going to be back to inequity. Right, so you have to really look, what we're finding and what we're learning is that you have to continue to ask the question. You have to continue to look at the data. And what was the second part of the question, moving forward? Yeah, I'm curious how the commission is engaging with adopters and plans mm -hmm. to, to you know, hold accountable these changes, right? Looking at data, best practices, and maybe what else they can do to, sure. to further. Absolutely, so I want to give a shout out to Christina Ratliff, who runs the Columbus Women's Commission now, and to Emily, who just joined us recently, um, both working very hard on this specific issue, which is how, as we continue to grow adopters, do we continue to level up our education and our best practices in terms of what we know works? For example, banning salary history. Right? We're also starting to think about things beyond wages, like equalizing paid family leave, like time off to take care of sick kids. You know, there, there are other things that can be done just around, uh, just to build around wages. And the other thing, continuing to remind employers and spouses and other people, don't make the decision for her. Don't say, she has small children, there's no way she would take this stretch assignment because she can't travel. Ask her, right? And some of those are really just empowering our adopters and others who are interested in adopting 
with, with these little nuggets that they, they then take back and start to ask at their own company. And that's, we, we haven't had to use a stick. We've been able to use a carrot and we have employers in the city and in the region who are interested in doing the right thing. Thank you. Barb, despite efforts like at the employer level for at the Columbus Commitment um, Pledge, you've been really intentional at Weld to build leadership skills in women, especially women of color, who experience this disparity the most. What are you hearing from those women directly about challenges they've had to navigate over the spans of their career, specifically factors that, that can affect their compensation? Thank you, Madam Moderator. First, what I'd like to do is thank um, the, the Columbus Metropolitan Club for doing this event and for shining a light on it. The more we shine a light on this, the more we're able to address the real issues that are creating this to begin with. I am grateful for having been able to serve under First Lady Shannon Ginther, work with Shelley Biding, and now support Christina Ratliff. Our, our programs are based upon data-driven research. It's based upon our own research, research from premier organizations like McKinsey, LeanIn.org, Latino Corporate Directors Association, African American Directors Forum. And what we found is that a lot of the findings in, those, in that research mirrors what our members are saying, our supporters, and women across our national footprint are saying about compensation and the challenges that they face. There's a list of them, but I'll focus on just two. The first is around challenges with career advancement. And as you know, the further you are in your career, the better opportunity you have to increase your compensation. So compensation is really a symptom of a broader issue. And the second is around negotiation skills and how to have that conversation about increasing your pay when you first um, get a job, how to have that conversation with your future employer and still get to keep that job offer, right? So first, starting with career advancement. One of the findings from McKinsey is that women, and especially women of color, aren't seen in senior leadership ranks because they never get the opportunity for that first promotion. They refer to that as the broken rung. And why is that important? Because it impacts what you don't see in the C-suite, and that's women and women of color being fairly represented. When they are at the leadership table, they are able to influence those conversations, ask the question, push management, encourage the board to look at pay disparity, to do the work, and to share best practices for the good of the whole. Um, what I find interesting about the most recent McKinsey research is some stats. And I know you shared some stats, but here's a, a, a couple that blew my mind. They look, at the first, um, they look at the first promotion of management and they said, based upon 2023 numbers, I believe, for every 100 white men who get promoted, 91 white women get their first promotion. I think 89 Asian women, um, African American women were 54 and Latinas were 76. That's 2023 data. If you look at 2018 data, specifically for African American women, that number was 54. If you look at 20, 2020 and 2021 data, it was 96, almost 100. I had to take these flimsy glasses off and put my Hubble <laughs> glasses, computer glasses on to look at that number again, 96. So we have shown we can do this. We can get to something that, that, meant, that is close to parity. But all of a sudden, it, it didn't just ebb, it fell off a cliff. Everything that we learned in 2020 and 2021 was if it didn't even exist. So that's the first thing around career advancement. There are the other issues that, you, you, that we've heard spoken about, um, lack of childcare, um, transportation for those who are on the lower economic um, strata. You know, how many of you drove here today? Raise your hand. How many of you had to take a bus to take your children to daycare today? There are people who have to take a bus to take your children to daycare and how that influences their ability to secure higher uh, paid jobs um, is very much tied to that. And then lastly, around the, the negotiation skills, we have found that women still are concerned about asking for that higher pay and how the future employer might perceive them. Uh, backlash, um, how they might per be perceived from an ambition standpoint, uh, not being able to come up with a number that they think is the right number, trying to understand the process, and, and who do you even ask 
those types of questions. So in, in a nutshell, the two big things are around career advancement and then how do they have that conversation? And we teach these in our programs on negotiation and for our pathway programs. Thank you so much. Dr. Chen, you have shared publicly your personal story um, experiencing an opportunity to uncover pay and equity in your workplace and advocating for change. Can you share some of that story and what the outcome was? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so I've done some research um, on Ohio State University's pay and equity for um, tenure track faculty and shared those reports with the University Senate, President and Provost. Um, along with Columbus Women's Commission uh, back in, in 2017. Uh, related to that, I also had my own pay equity case at Ohio State. It was resolved internally. Um, and the good news is I got a 20% pay adjustment. Um, which means right out of the previous five years that I'd been working at the university, one of those years had essentially been for free. Uh, <laughs> So I'll share some of the things, some things about the process and, and some things that I learned along the way. Um, so I was fortunate in that for faculty at the university, there is a pretty well-defined process. You go through your department chair and then there's a college level grievance committee that does the review and then the dean uh, makes the final decision. Um, and so the first step in the process was for me to document, and, and I'll note, by the way, that I'm a labor economist, so this is my bread and butter. I know how to do this, right? Other people don't have this training, right? It's not their expertise. So how we would expect individuals to go in and address their own pay equity cases without the help of HR, without the help of lawyers, consultants, economists is, um, is beyond me, right? And even for me, it took probably 40 hours for me to compile all the data. I was able to do so because Ohio State University has publicly available salary data for which, you know, folks who don't work at the, at the university don't have that data available to them. Um, I pulled together all the metrics on productivity of my peers and put together a whole case about why. And it's hard, right? It's hard emotionally to sit down and have to prove to somebody else that you're just as good as the people in the same job as you, right? It's very draining. Um, and so I did that step and then we got into discussions of what the actual numbers should be, right? So here I learned there's sort of two different spaces. One is the space of kind of an external equity metric, right? So has your employer been keeping up with how the external market's been moving, right? And we know for folks who tend to stay in their jobs for longer periods of time without transitioning across organizations or across roles, your pay tends to stagnate, right? Those year-to-year -year raises usually are not very big. Um, so that's one piece, right? So you can bring up that issue of like, hey, I've been here for a long time, and that was part of what happened to me, um, and the pay increases in my role just hadn't kept up with the rest of the market. The other piece where it gets very touchy um, and has a, a big danger of sliding into the confrontational, right, is bringing up the internal equity issues, right, of saying, well, actually, I've been doing all this unpaid work at work, right, that you're not counting as work. The students who come to me because I'm approachable, the other faculty members who come to me because I'm approachable, the extra committees I have to be on as a woman of color, right, or I'm asked to be on as a woman of color, right, all of that doesn't count um, towards salary increases and promotion, right, in the current system. So that's part of what we need to change, right? The other thing is even unconscious bias among evaluators of how they perceive the work. Right, something that I do with a male colleague, and we have research on this, right, that papers, academic papers written by women, if they're co-authored with another, with a man, then the women are perceived as having done less work than if they're co-authored with another woman, right, despite the order of the authors um, in the listing, right? So all of those, so having to bring those kinds of issues up, right, with your manager, your department chair is very challenging. And so I was fortunate to have the university or the college grievance committee to discuss those issues with as well. Um, and the other thing I learned was that there is a tendency, um, I think sometimes to try to defer concerns about pay equity based on a appeal to a broader 
sense of equity, right? Where I heard this, com this argument of, um, well, you know, the salary compression is something that happens to lots of people at the university. It's not something we can fix. You know, and, I, and but my response was, I, I understand that. You know, it is a broader problem. I don't see that as justification for not fixing this problem that is in front of you right now. Right? And so I think the need for us as individuals to also push for that and say, no, we have to fix what we can as we go along, right, and, and do what's possible um, while keeping in mind that there is a bigger problem that, that needs to be addressed. Um, and I'll also mention that um, at the Women's Place at Ohio State, where I'm serving as a faculty fellow this year, we do quarterly workshops on negotiation techniques of how to have these kinds of conversations and what data to bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. And um, I have to imagine you have had quite an impact on those who have come after you. So it's not easy being the one to say this isn't right. So thank you. Um, so even with efforts like the Columbus commitment, leadership training, advocates like Dr. Chen, the pay gap still persists. We have to talk about this from a systems level, especially when you consider low-wage workers, hourly workers, folks that just don't have the ability to negotiate um, or have weak workplace protections. To put it simply, we can't empower ourselves out of equity issues. Um, not all of us have the opportunity to work for employers who value fair wages. So systems change. It's not easy, it's not quick. Um, federally, the Paycheck Fairness Act, which would close loopholes in pay discrimination laws, has been introduced 14 times since 1997 and still sits today unpassed. Ohio currently doesn't have a law that, guarantees, that guarantees women equal pay for equal work. Various equal pay bills have been introduced over the years and currently House Bill 115 sits in committee without a single hearing scheduled. What are steps that we can take from a policy perspective, especially locally, thinking about the progress that has been made with the salary history ban, um, to close this pay gap? How can we address this here in Columbus? This question is just open to all of you. So I can start. I'll start with the bad news. <laughs> the bad news is that that bill that sits in the Ohio House in committee will sit there and it will be reintroduced and reintroduced and reintroduced. We are not at a place statewide where we're ready for this. That doesn't mean that there isn't great opportunity here in Columbus, which is why we launched the Columbus Women's Commission in the first place, to draw attention to it, to figure out strategies to help employers make their way through it, then building on like, okay, we're not seeing a lot of change, so let's ban prior salary history. There are other opportunities, um, you know, as we go, we'll see other policy levers that we can potentially use to push this forward. But the other piece of this is on each one of you. It, standing in your own power when you ask the question, when they say, not in Columbus, maybe outside of the city limits, or maybe they do say, well, what was your prior salary history? And your response is, what does the job pay? And their response is, well, we really need to know your prior, no, you don't. What, what, was one of the, what does one of the stickers say? You wouldn't ask me my age. Would, why would you ask me my salary? Right, like you, you all have to continue to be willing to ask the question even when it's uncomfortable. And if it doesn't get solved, change jobs. I've done it in my career. I, I'm, you've done it, obviously. I mean. That is, that is a possibility. And the other piece I would say is big data is here. And increasingly, even for private companies, it's going to be easier and easier to figure out who's making what. And if your leadership is not willing to fix it, don't work there. Increasingly, companies will, they are coming along and they will, they look at data analytics, they, they want to do the right thing, they want to pay people equitably, work there. Those companies will continue to do what they're doing, which will kind of raise all boats. That's at least, that's been our experience with the Women's Commission, is that, is that companies continue to want to do more to keep the, the uh, playing field level. I have a few suggestions also to support what First Lady just shared. 
Um, and I'm about to date myself, but Norma Ray is about to come out and play, okay? <laughs> um, first, we can raise the minimum wage. That actually helps men and women. Um, we can increase pay transparency is what um, was just stated. It can help narrow the gender pay gap by like 30% per the National Bureau of Economic Research. Pay what the job is worth. And I know some of y'all, you just ate, but I'm gonna tell you, unionized places. Women working in unions earn an average of 94 cents on the dollar compared to men versus non-union at 78 cents, according to the Economic Policy Institute. Standard, that's because wages are standardized, pay is transparent, there are grievance procedures, they can secure related benefits, um, scheduling accommodations, implement fair scheduling practices. I don't know how many of you, yeah, I don't know how many of you are in the service sector where, you know, it's not nine to five, you're 24-7, you're, you're working in a restaurant. How hard is it to get daycare when you never know when you're gonna be working the, the next week? Um, some states have actually uh, enacted fair work week laws like New Hampshire, Vermont, Oregon. Um, some cities like New York, Seattle, San Francisco have done it. Expand paid family leave and medical leave. Access to child care is like a no-brainer. Um, again, stop asking people for their prior salary is what was stated before. Um, ensure that companies are doing regular pay audits. How do you know if you have a problem or don't have a problem if you don't secure the data? And then in general, the workforce initiatives to help women get into hard hat skills where they can get additional pay. You know, and, and the list continues. Um, I know some of these are probably won't be palatable for some companies and some individuals, but I, you know, we were asked the question, how do you fix it? And so there are some suggestions. <laughs> Yeah, I would add for um, our male allies, it can be very helpful to be transparent about your own salary and benefits and uh, extra, you know, supplemental compensation, bonuses, things like that, so women understand. I know I've been in roles where I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that was a way I could get paid, and you've been getting that for five years, right? There's, there's a lot that we just don't even know, and, and to advocate for your own staff, right? If you see a pay inequity, in your staff, you should work to get it fixed. Um, on the pay transparency page, I would love to see as other localities and states have enacted pay um, equity reporting, right, mandated, um, where companies have to report uh, average pay for men and women across you know, the top 10 roles or something like that um, and make that publicly available. Um, those internal, I think, pay equity audits are really important, again, because individuals cannot be expected to be able to put together the information needed for a pay equity case, right? They are gonna lose against their manager and against HR almost every time, right? So we need that to happen from the top down so that it's not a confrontational discussion between an employee and a manager, right? And it doesn't create bad blood. I, did, I also did it. I knew I was underpaid for five years before I was said anything because I had a tenure vote coming up and I couldn't risk, I didn't wanna risk that. Right, and so it's, the, it's that kind of precarity, right, that, um, that we need to remove from the, so that everyone can be empowered to ask for, for what they deserve, right. Um, the other thing I'll mention, right, is that research shows that the largest contributors to the gender pay gap are um, differences in how um, different sectors are compensated, right, so the undervaluation of caregiving sectors, right, and sectors that have been feminized that are largely women. Right, is, is one big factor, um, and then also the differences in promotion, right, being set on the mommy track um, once you have kids, and it's a well-documented mom penalty and dad bonus, right? Men have kids, they make more money. Women have kids, they make less money, right? So again, that childcare piece has to come in, um, and in general, the valuation of, of caregiving that happens both in the workplace and outside the workplace. Thank you. Loving these suggestions. Um, it is CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. So we are going to ask just one more here. Um, but if you have a question, you can make your way to the back of the room to the audience microphone. Um, and if you're watching online, you can type your questions into the chat. Um, so my last question, something that we are talking about all the time in Columbus is growth. Our region is rapidly changing. And with that comes more diversity, right? Women are 
entering the workforce, starting in new industries to help meet this workforce need um, as, we're, as we're bracing ourselves for the next few years. How do we ensure that as our community grows, this gap doesn't widen, that we're not gonna let this fall through the cracks? And what can we do to meet this moment with the urgency it requires? I'll give, I'll give one quick statement. More women and women of color at the decision-making table as business growth plans are being developed. Um, I think one thing we've seen since um, COVID is the desire for flexible work. And we know that benefits women disproportionately as well. Right? My concern is that a lot of the flexible work we're seeing now is in the form of gig work, of side hustles, right? of the Amazon um, shift where you're not fully a driver, but you can deliver packages while the kids are at school, right? which doesn't come with benefits, which doesn't come with a pension, which doesn't come with unemployment. Right? So I'd love to see us move towards some more flexible work options, different timing for shifts, right, um, bridge care for child care, transportation, those kinds of things, and make sure that we don't push that into the gig economy space. And I think, um, you know, as we grow, continuing to highlight the companies that are doing it well, using these companies to teach other companies how to do it better, how to continue to improve, talk about it, pass laws where we need, where we see that there are gaps that advocacy just isn't working. Um, you know, it's, we're just gonna have to be really cognizant of the data as we move forward and what is happening and then implementing things as we go to try to counterbalance that because it will be, continue to be, as I mentioned, a struggle statewide. So we will have to do it as we can um, more regionally. Madam Moderator, one last quick question, uh, point. The other thing is, if your company hasn't signed the Columbus commitment, sign it. Your CEO needs to sign it. They provide a roadmap of how to address this issue. Um, and there are companies out there that are really doing it well and really taking this seriously. And they share best practices, so you're not in this by yourself trying to figure it out. There are companies that know how to do this and they are knocking it out the park. If you sign the Columbus commitment and participate in the variety of forms and, and support services that they have, you'll be able to be more successful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, so Doug with CMC is curating questions from our live stream audience. Um, for those of you here, again, please join Doug in the back of the room. What's our first question? Uh, thank you, Tanya, and thank you to today's panelists. Um, I know many of you have questions for our panelists, so please do come uh, line up behind me, and we'll get to as many as we can. And again, if you're watching on the live chat, um, please enter your question into the chat, and we'll try to get to that, too. Um, please do keep in mind that great questions at CMC have two things in common. Uh, they take about 30 seconds to ask, or less, and they end with a question mark, so thank you. Um, so here's one. Um, Robert Moore with MPCC uh, says, um, to all of you and no one in particular, have you heard I love you today? Keep doing this work. Thank you. Aww. And there is a question mark in there. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Um, Barb, you touched on this, but it may be worth expanding on. Um, so here's, here's, a, here's a question to get us uh, started. Um, a recent Pew study found that a majority of surveyed women attributed the gender pay gap to the biased behavior of employers uh, versus factors like educational attainment. Many individual women may be fearful of losing their jobs if they try to address this behavior themselves. So can you expand or reflect on the role of unionized labor to address this behavior of employers? Are union Unions part of the answer to closing the gender pay gap? Unions are part of the answer, but not all the answer, because not all environments are unionized or will ever get unionized. It's, it's not a one-size-fit-all. But what does work well for unions is that there are grievance processes, there are standardized wages, um, you have resources to go to bat for you, you're not doing it by yourself. So that's the value of where unions come into play. Again, that works for some situations, not all situations. And when you have a toolkit, don't just always try to go after the hammer when maybe it's the screwdriver or the wrench that you might need in order to get the job done. 
Hi there, my name is Andrea Applegate with Applegate Talent Strategies. Um, Dr. Chen, you talked a little bit about this just a moment ago, but I think it is worth um, putting a finer point on it, and I'd like to open it up to all of you to get your feedback on this. Um, based on her research, uh, Dr. Claudia Golden recently was awarded a Nobel Prize in Economics for her work on what she calls the couple equity. And in heterosexual cisgender relationships, it is typically the woman who steps back from her job and from her career when um, uh, uh, to, to be available for children, childcare, and family care. Um, a Wall Street Journal article um, on March 8th titled The Gender Pay Gap is a Myth That Won't Go Away um, acknowledges that um, the choices women make, or in Dr. Golden's world, the choices couples make, influences the wages that women make. Um, and assuming that a woman chooses to stay in the workforce while she has children, um, and that stepping back typically means taking a job with more flexibility. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going, uh, there needs to be some definitions and parameters on this. So flexibility does not mean fully remote. Flexibility means flexibility in start and stop times, in hours in a day, days in a week, um, uh, cross training, um, lots of things like that. So if, um, if wages are paid to um, people with, uh, w who take jobs with less flexibility or lower wages are paid, how can we normalize or make the norm flexibility so that all people have flexibility and that's not the thing that is penalizing uh, women at work? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. I will shout out to Ohio State. I actually, when I was, um, prior to when I was tenured, I actually was able to do a part-time tenure track role um, where I reduced my appointment to 66% and cut my pay by a third, but also reduced my teaching and, and service requirements at that time. And that felt like a real solution to me, right? I was able to continue in the career path that I had chosen, but actually have more time to balance work and family obligations. Um, so I would love to see more options like that, where I, you don't have to step back from the track that you want to be on just because you would like to have more time to be with your family. And I think that benefits men and women equally. We all would like to participate more in the parenting of our children, right, and um, be less restricted um, by sort of a, a nine to five work day. Right? And I think some of that is also, as we learned during COVID lockdown, right, is that we can trust our employees to do what they need to do without being in an office and being watched or being, you know, we don't need that, right? Employees don't need that to deliver. They delivered when they had to, right? Um, and so now that corporations seem to be, in some places seem to be wanting to revoke that option, even after employees were so flexible with all of those challenges in schooling and childcare, I think is, has been really um, upsetting to me, right? And, and really disappointing. I would say um, there's so much information available now on companies who are doing it right. Go work there. Right, I mean, and I know it's not always that simple, but the company I work for currently, Accenture, they provide backup childcare if your kid gets sick and you have to go on site to a client meeting. There are flexible work arrangements, and not everybody can work for an Accenture or any particular company, but there is so much information out there, even locally, about the great companies to work for in this community. Go there, if that's, People will follow others who are doing it well. And sometimes that's the way forward. Because then that encourages other people to look around and say, look, we're losing our employees to this company and that company because they're offering these pieces of flexibility. And I mean, it's hard to think about changing a job sometimes, especially when you're looking for flexibility. But you got to go where people value you. There is a list of 400 plus companies on the Columbus Women's Commission website that you can consider if you need a place to start. 
Um, Ann Gabriel, Ohio University, retired. Um, I've kind of got a two-pronged question. We talk about growth, especially here in central Ohio, and for the very high-paying jobs, we know there's a huge skill gap. So what can be done or is being done to make sure it's the women that are filling that skills gap for these higher paying jobs. And the second prong is how do we go back to elementary school, high school, and get women interested in those STEM type jobs that's gonna to lead to um, higher careers? So I can start as it relates to getting women upskilled, if you will. Um, the city, through the mayor's leadership, has uh, required unions who are building all city buildings, I may get this mostly right, all city buildings have to have women and minorities as part of their work crews. And so in order to get, be awarded those contracts, you have to train women and minorities, you have to recruit them to the skilled trades. We're doing some initiatives right now with women in the trades to get women into the trades, into these jobs that pay 150 thousand dollars a year two hundred thousand dollars a year that's one way the other way that I know Columbus State is working very closely right now with the other community colleges in getting women and minorities skilled for semiconductor with Intel and all of the micro industry coming around Intel there are very targeted efforts for women and minorities uh, because we know right now for example there are 10 percent of women in semiconductor and if Intel wants to open their plant at 50-50, we got a ways to go. So some of these very targeted initiatives are ways that, that the city and the, the educational community is coming around to try to solve that gap, close that gap. And some of it is a communication issue, making sure that women know about the opportunities that, are, that were just shared here. Um, on the border of Ohio and West Virginia, Nucor Steel is building like a two and a half billion dollar company and they uh, connected with Weld to find out how they can um, reach women to encourage them to consider careers in the, in the steel industry. It's not your grandpa's steel industry where you have to lift 500 pound things and sit there with hot stuff flying all over the place. You know, it's computerized, right? And, and so it's an, it's an educational issue to help um, inform women of the opportunities that, that they, could be, they may be ready for today. And so how do we spread that word and touch as many women as possible about these higher skilled, um, higher paid jobs that are available for them? After the um, Supreme Court decision related to affirmative action, I do think it's going to become more challenging for public universities and K through 12 schools to have those kinds of targeted programs that help to upskill women in particular. Um, so there's going to be need to be more engagement from private sector partners um, and uh, to to fill those gaps. Um, so so please vote. Um, the other thing I want to make sure is that we don't forget um, other sectors, right? We continue to have huge shortages in the childcare sector, in nursing, in K through 12 teachers, right? Because those jobs are not paying enough, right? And we need people in those jobs, right? So what we need to address that big systemic problem, right, of the underpay, um, or, or the, you know, the too low pay in those sectors because those are also the sectors, child care and K through 12 education in particular, right, that oftentimes limit women's labor force participation and how much we can engage in those stretch assignments and promotions and things like that. Thank you. We have about six minutes left and I think three questions, so we'll try to get to all three. Um, Cece Harris wants to know, uh, what do you say or do when your employer or manager tells you not to talk about salary? I think that's illegal. Bye. <laughs> 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 I'm pretty sure that's illegal. Uh, I'm Bryn Bunnell. I was wondering for the Columbus Commitment Pledge, to what extent have the signers seen real policy change? Well, I think one piece of policy change is prohibiting salary history now, you know, across the city now because we recognize that that was something. Some employers were willing to do it, take it off, just take the question off of the application the, online. Others didn't, and so there was still that gap so we filled it, council member filled it with law. 
So I think there's, I'm a big believer in trying, starting voluntarily. So, so there were, and continue to be, other women's commissions, there are a few across the country, we're one of a handful. A couple of them mandated data reporting, you know, all kinds of different things. And then the women's commission staff spent their time chasing all the employers around for their data, and then everybody wanted to argue about what the data looked like and how it was cut and this. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to start with the people who were ready to make a change and build from there. And that's what we'll continue to do and fill it in where necessary with law that um, can continue our forward motion. Good afternoon, I'm Rebecca Nelson. My question is about the intersection between know your place aggression and pay equity issues in the workplaces, particularly when I think about what's happening to immigrant women around our country, around our city. I'd love to know your opinions and how we can address that and how we can go forward. Can you repeat, can you please repeat the first part of the question? I, I missed the very first part of it. There's been a lot of discussion about know your place aggression with women of color in prominent positions around the United States, with how immigrant women find the culture in their workplace to be hostile, et cetera. So I'd love to know your opinion and your recommendations for how we can move forward with this intersecting with pay equity, pay gap issues. I think it begins in the boardroom at the top of the organization. And it begins with holding CEOs accountable for the culture of the organizations that they lead and holding the management, management team accountable for the culture of the organizations that they lead. I think it begins at the top, it really does. Yes, you can do some things organically. Companies are doing wonderful things around business resource groups, employee resource groups, but I believe it starts at the top. You know, HR goes to management, to senior leaders, and says, this is the pay gap in this role. This is the pay gap in this role. Go back to your people, figure out why this pay gap exists and whether or not it's justified. If it's not, then you fix it. Right? We need to take the onus, again, off of the individual, because it, I had the same, you know, people, I had a mentor tell me, um, you know, just keep your head down and keep working hard and don't worry about what other people are getting paid. Right, know my place, and that was not my place um, in his view. Right, so I just think we have to take it out of the individuals, take the burden off the individual, and put it onto the HR staff that are there to to monitor these things. At the end of the day, you know, there's there's phenomenal work being done. Companies are many companies are coming at it from the right perspective, really wanting to do this, um, with a fierce competition for talent. Those companies that are doing it right, doing it well, will be the winners. It, and that's how business works, right? You produce a better product and produce the right thing that attracts the best employees, you're gonna get them. Sorry, one other thing I'll add is that th there is a challenge, and it's happened in my case too, right, of where I was underpaid and the university still is, um, acknowledges this as, as a me problem. It was localized to me. It was not acknowledged as a gender pay disparity. Right, and so there's something that needs to be bridged between all of our individual cases and how we make the case for the collective of, no, this is actually related to gender, right? Even though, yes, there is a woman in my unit who's paid more than me, right, and who paid more than the men. That doesn't mean there isn't a gender issue at play. Right? We have about a minute left for one final question. Hi, Eric Korolek with Action for Children. Uh, the care economy has come up, and I wonder if you could speak to unpaid labor, women's unpaid labor in the home in particular, and if there's an element of the, the way men and women in families divide labor and how that might improve over time. I haven't seen it. I, I know there's some data about generational differences, and I wonder if you could speak to that. There's definitely a bit of a vicious cycle in place here, right? With the gender pay gap of 17 cents, if one person needs to take a step back from their career to manage caregiving, it's going to be the one probably who earns less money, right? Um, and so we need to 
be able to break out of that as well, right? Because that sort of drives the pattern, the gendered patterns of unpaid labor that, um, that we continue to see. One quick thing, imagine being a single parent household. There is no one to divide the work up with. It's you, yourself, and you. All right, so I am getting this signal to wrap it up, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Carrie for concluding remarks. Everyone, I hope, you, I hope you found this conversation as important, interesting, stimulating as I did. I can't wait to uh, process a lot of what I heard today. Uh, thank you again for our sponsors of today's forum, the Mary Lazarus Legacy and Civic Engagement Fund, Crane Group, the Columbus Women's Commission, Event Marketing Strategies, and The Ohio State University. Also our partner, the Women's Fund of Central Ohio, and our host, The Ellis. And we're grateful to our presenting sponsors of our live stream, the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation, and our live stream partner, the Columbus Dispatch. Thank you all. We are very appreciative to today's speakers, Councilmember Barossa de Padilla, Dr. Joyce Chen, First Lady Shannon Genther, Barb Smoot, and our host, Tanya Salyers. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Go ahead and start making plans for upcoming forums. Uh, next week, please join us for Solitude to Solidarity, Healing Ohio's Loneliness Epidemic, featuring Dr. Amy Acton and a panel of passionate experts. Related to one of the questions we just heard, towards the end of the month, you can also look for a forum featuring uh, the conversation on immigrants and the economy called How Immigrants Revitalize Communi Communities. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for you who are joining on live stream. We appreciate you all. Be safe today. Thank you.